Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so first of all, by a show of hands, how many people in here are investors? How many people are entrepreneurs? How many people are planning on becoming entrepreneurs? Good. Uh, how many people have raised capital? And how many people have bootstrapped their companies? Good. So I'm going to talk today about bootstrapping versus uh, raising capital. Um, first, though, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story, just to give you some background so that you know why uh, I think I can give you some information about bootstrapping versus raising capital. So first of all, I am, can you, okay, better here, right? Yeah. First of all, I am Colombian. Uh, I l fell in love with computers when I was four. This is me. And uh, why I fell in love with computers? Well, first, because I w had access to one computer. I come from a modest family, so we didn't have a computer at home. But uh, because, I become, uh, because I became obsessed with computers, I asked every single adult that I came across for a computer including, of course, my dad. Now, I didn't used to live with my dad. My parents had divorced. But uh, he told me that now that I was getting into school, primary school, if I got the best score on my school, he would give me a computer. So that had one important effect on me, and that is I became, it became the biggest, or not the biggest, but the most fanatical nerd in school. Uh, because I really wanted to get that highest score. And in fact, when I was in second grade, I ended up getting the highest score in my school. It was a 5,000 uh, people school, so it wasn't easy. I got a certificate from school. I went to my mom. I told my mom, mom, please get me in touch with my dad. Two weeks later, I was in the phone with my dad. I told my dad, dad, I did what you told me. Uh, I got the best grade in my school. Now you can give me the computer that you promised me. And uh, that was... 1984, that was uh, 19, 29 years ago. Well, to this day, I'm still waiting for the computer. Uh, not only that, eventually, one of my companies sold computers. He bought a computer from me, but he never paid. So he owes me two computers now. Uh, but I ended up really liking being a nerd, a geek in school. And um, after 10 years of obsession with computers, I finally was able to start my first, or to get my first computer by uh, building my first company. Uh, this is the neighborhood where I used to live in Colombia, Villas de Granada in Bogota. How many Colombians here, by the way? Good. Uh, so I'm from Bogota. This is Villas de Granada. It's on the outskirts of Bogota. As we say in Spanish, this is where El Viento Llega y Se Vuelve, where the wind gets to and then comes back, because it's really far away. And uh, what I did is I got a loan to buy a computer to do data entry work. And in one year, I was able to pay back for that loan. And eventually, the business ended up becoming an IT consulting business with more than 25 people. But then I moved to Miami. Uh, why Miami or why the US? Because I realized that technology innovation was happening in the US. I wanted to be here. And uh, this is me. I used glasses not because I needed glasses, just because I wanted to look older. Now, Looking back, of course, I didn't look older. I look even more geek. But, uh, and um, I did what um, many people, uh, many Latinos, when we arrived here to the US do. I realized that my English was really bad. So I ended up working in Starbucks and McDonald's, making coffee, cooking hamburgers. Uh, so that's why I make really good coffee and really bad hamburgers, just in case you come to my house. And, uh, Eventually, I realized that uh, I was living in Latin America. That's why then I decided to migrate to New York City, uh, being Miami, of course, the capital of Latin America. And in New York City, I started my uh, series of founding companies here uh, in the US. The first one, Rentalo, a vacation rental marketplace, similar to HomeAway, but b before HomeAway actually existed. I then met um, my current wife, uh, only wife I've ever had, uh, Tanya, my, the love of my life. Now, this is, this is Tanya 13 years ago. This is me 13 years ago. Yeah, you laugh. I, because, and that's true, because I had no idea what Tanya saw on me. And I've been thinking about it, and I come to realize, I came to the realization that the only thing she saw on me was potential. Uh, and uh, we ended up, uh, she was a voice actress, so I learned about the voice acting industry. And this is how the voice acting industry used to work back in the day. You needed, uh, you had a company that required a voice for a project, whether that's a video game, 
a phone system, a TV ad, a radio ad, an audiobook, whatever. Now, you needed to go to a casting director, then to a talent agent, then to, an, uh, to a talent, then you, the talents had to go to auditioning studios, and uh, if the buyer liked one of the uh, auditions, then they had to contact a recording studio, and if everything went according to plan, then they had to get the unions involved, and then there were so many people involved that they needed yet another person called a paymaster that would get the money and distribute the money among all these people in here. So I decided, or we decided together, let's build something online that is going to automate all this. And that's how we created Voice123 10 years ago. Now, Voice123 is a marketplace for voice acting similar to Elan's. Now, that company today is actually called Bonnie Inc. And we have multiple brands, not only Voice123. Today we have the brand that most people know me for today, which is Voice Bonnie. Uh, and it's more automated that Elan's is more like the Uber for um, voiceovers, in case you need a voice. So eventually, uh, well, Voice123 was a side business for many years. I've been focusing Bonnie Inc. only for two years. Before that, Voice123 was a side business. Uh, I was still working in Rentalo and doing some other consulting on the side, but that allowed me to also experiment by co-founding several other companies. When I was 26, I co-founded Language123, kind of Elans for translators. Then I founded Casting123, kind of an Elans again, but for actors and models. Then Serverco, a hosting company. Then Dashbell, which is kind of an um, open table for hotels. Then uh, Hubbug, the first co-working space in Colombia. Um, Localo, an Airbnb for Latin America. And We Hostels, which we sold two weeks ago. Um, a kind of hotel tonight for, uh, for hostels, of course. So I've done a lot of things. Uh, I also, uh, I've done some angel investing as well, so I've been on the other side of the table. And uh, recently I had the chance of pushing for immigration reform uh, as well. And this is me. As you can see, not very happy with the work that this guy has done so far. Uh, and uh, more recently even, it became a dad. So now I'm the dad at a beautiful gringuita, as you see here. So, uh, Statistics. So I co-founded, as you saw, 11 companies, 14 different business units within those companies. And uh, out of those companies, I have bootstrapped, or we have, because I think that in all of them except one, I've been, I have co-founders. We bootstrap eight of those companies, and we receive capital, venture capital, on three uh, of them. Now, what's the status of those companies? Four of them failed. They no longer exist. Four of them are profitable, they exist, they are making money, and in most cases they are pay paying dividends. Um, one is hanging in there, so it's one of the ones that raise capital that might or might not make it, we'll see. And uh, we sold two of the businesses. Now, uh, the bottom line, and this is pretty much the core of the presentation. Uh, as an entrepreneur, which ones ended up making me happier, and which ones ended up making more money for me? Uh, so the venture back, unrealized gains, uh, meaning how much money in theory do I have in paper uh, that eventually might become money if we, sold, if we were to sell those companies. Well, uh, for the venture back companies, the un unrealized gains that I have is around $4 million, and realized gains, meaning the amount of money that I have been able to pocket, can somebody guess? Zero. So nice. I have some money that I might get in the future, but I don't have it in my pocket. I cannot use it. Now, bootstrap, unrealized gains, $50 million, meaning that's more or less the value of the equity that I have in the companies that I have co-founded if they were to be sold today. Uh, realized gains, $8 million, meaning out of dividends, salaries, and exits, I've made $8 million that I've been able to use for whatever the fuck I want. And that's why some people call this, uh, if you guys are familiar with this, some people call this amount of money, fuck your money, because now you don't need to kiss the ass of anybody else. So, and what did I use this money for? Well, I invest in some other companies, I've traveled, I bought an apartment, I sold an apartment, and now we finally decided to have uh, a baby, and we don't have to worry about money, fortunately. So, uh, by the way, fuck you money is a real term that people use to refer to the amount of money that you need in order not to worry about having to work the rest of your life. I'm not going there yet, I'm not going to retire just yet, but uh, 
my point is that the companies that we bootstrap ha have allowed me to pocket more money than the ones that we ended up trying to get venture capital for. So uh, as a consequence of that, I have become to some extent uh, an activist in bootstrapping because I think that many people think about raising capital by default. They don't consider bootstrapping their companies even though it might be a better solution. So I'm going to uh, uh, try to debunk some myths in here about uh, raising capital. The first one, the investors, VCs provide great advice. Yeah, kind of, but based on my experience, when you build a board of advisors that is well built, you can get much, much better advice and you don't have to give up 20% of your company. Advisors, they are usually happy with less than a fraction of a point of your company and they're going to work harder for you than uh, any VC. Not only that, they are going to care about the future of the company in the long term, not, they're not going to necessarily advise you, keeping in mind that they have to sell your company within five to seven years at the most. Mid number two. Uh, you need capital to grow your user, to your user base. I see uh, a lot today entrepreneurs trying to raise capital to invest in marketing because they have built a product and now they are trying to market the product. I think that's a big mistake because if word of mouth is not good enough to grow your product, the problem that you have, your user base, the problem that you have is not capital, is that your product is not good enough. Capital should usually be raised, it's my opinion, of course, when you want to grow faster, not simply when you want to grow from zero to 100. From zero to 100, even to 1,000, you should be able, your product needs to be good enough to grow by itself. Uh, capital is raised in order to grow faster than uh, you would if you were not to have capital. Myth number three, uh, it's important to start talking to investors early on. Yeah, kind of uh, as well, but the reality is that uh, Every minute of your time that you invest raising capital is a minute of your time that you don't invest either building your product or, sell it or selling to your clients. So you're sacrificing uh, time, and time is the only commodity that you cannot get back in your life. Myth number four, uh, you need investors so that you can quit your job and focus on your startup. So probably this doesn't apply to most of the people here, here since you guys are probably already focused in the company, but I constantly hear people that are either consultants or they have a work, uh, a job somewhere that they need to raise capital in order to focus in the company full time. Uh, my advice is that, or my take on that, that's bullshit, you don't need to do that. What you need to do is, if you're working right now uh, at a company, keep your job and then consult on this side, become a good consultant, then uh, with your additional time, with your extra time, start working on your idea, and then once your idea is generating enough cash flow, then you go full time into your idea. Uh, if you cannot be a good consultant, if you can't start a business as a consultant, it's very unlikely that you're going to be able to start a business that actually has a product or a service. Uh, so if you fail as a consultant, reconsider being an entrepreneur. Seriously. <laughs> I mean, being a consultant is relatively easy co compared to all of the things that you have to do for being an entrepreneur, so uh, think about it. Now, when to raise capital? There are a couple of moments in time when you might actually need to raise capital. One is when your business is ad based. So if you're building the next, the next Facebook or the next Google, you should raise capital because you're not going to be able to monetize your user base unless you have millions and millions, probably hundreds of millions of users in your system, but these are the exceptions to the rule. Most companies don't need, don't have that business model. Most companies are making money because they have a service that people are willing to pay for uh, directly. Uh, another reason for raising capital is when you are, want to invest in paid user acquisition and the cost of acquiring a user, a user is higher than the amount of money that you can get back from that user within a, within a few weeks, maybe within a few months. Meaning, I have to invest maybe 100 bucks to get a user, and I'm not going to be able to get those 100 bucks within a few weeks. Then you raise capital, because uh, otherwise you're not going to have enough money to grow your business. However, the most beautiful companies are the companies where the user acquisition cost is lower than the amount of money that you can get back from that user within a couple of weeks. So if you have to invest 100 bucks getting a user, and you get $150 from that user within a few weeks, 
beautiful, that's beautiful because now you have 150 bucks to invest in new users. And uh, those businesses can be bootstrapped, and not only can be bootstrapped, they can grow really fast without using any kind of venture capital. And finally, if you have a hardware company, you might want to raise capital. However, if you, my recommendation is only to do it if you have already run a successful Kickstarter campaign. If you are not capable of, of uh, doing a Kickstarter campaign and raising capital, you might not be successful trying to raise capital from investors for a hard work uh, startup. Now, some additional tips. Um, once you raise capital, there is no going back. So w when you hire an employee and you don't like that employee, you can fire that employee. Uh, when uh, you get married and you don't like your wife, you can get divorced, right? It's almost impossible to get rid of an investor in your company. So. Uh, w while you have bootstrap, if you bootstrap your company, you can go and raise capital at any uh, at any moment in time. But if you raise capital already, there is no way back. You cannot go back and bootstrap the company. So it's a one-way decision. Um, there are many other ways of raising capital. Recently, I was talking to an entrepreneur that has um, that is building a B2B, and the companies are going to pay him 60 days after delivery of the services that they offer. And he needed capital in order to be able to keep the cash flow. He had no idea that he could actually talk to banks, and banks will buy those invoices from him uh, at a discount that is usually very small. And uh, it's not only better, I think, because he's not giving up the company, or a percentage of the company to do that, but also talking to the banks is going to allow him to scale that business model more and more. If he went, if he went the VC route and he wanted to raise $5 million to keep that kind of cash in the bank and he, the business grows and now he wants to invoice even more, then he will have to raise money once again. So I know that there are some other ways of raising capital as well, venture debt, et cetera, et cetera. If your business is really cool, it's cash positive, it's growing, uh, many banks are willing to give you money in exchange for just a couple of points of your company. And uh, something else that I've noticed after having 11 companies is that the best businesses, when they are really good, VCs and angels come after you to give you money. And they usually come after you to give you money when the business has reached that moment when it's a good business. Before that, it's very difficult for you to raise capital. Most people are going to say, mm, come back when you have reached this uh, and that goal. So my suggestion is focus on your product, grow your company, talk to VCs, but don't try to raise capital. Talk to VCs and angels as mentors, advisors, not as people that are going to give you money. And eventually, they themselves are going to offer you money when they see that that's a good fit. And in most cases, if you bootstrap, you're going to be able to tell them, fuck you, I don't need your money. Uh, now, finally, as I mentioned at the beginning, don't raise capital just because uh, everybody around you is raising capital. The press, investors, and as I mentioned, I've been an investor before. I continue investing in companies every now and then. Uh, we are really good at making people believe that raising capital is the way to go. Why? Because that's how we make money, right? Uh, but that's not the only way of doing it. Consider doing it the old way, bootstrapping. And uh, finally, if you are an entrepreneur because you want to be happy, ba based at least on my experience, Bootstrapping a company is more likely to allow you to be happy than if you went the venture back way. Uh, that's it. If you guys have questions, I'll be more than happy to answer. <laughs> no, I, I don't go and say fuck you to everybody, right? I'm sorry for the for, for those words, but um, it's the idea behind uh, most. This has happened to me. Like today with Bonnie Inc. I constantly get emails from VCs that I talked to uh, several years ago, pitching them the idea, and now that they have seen how the company is growing, they have to invest. But back in the day, they didn't believe in what we were doing. So it's very reconforting, I think, to be able to tell them, thank you, but I no longer need your money. I needed your money back in the day, or I thought I needed your money back in the day, but I really don't need your money um, any longer. Uh, questions? I don't know if we have, we time. have uh, time for one question. Anyone? All right, right, right there. Have you ever, um, uh, when you were starting to save time, did you, did you 
Yeah, no, and that was a big mistake actually. Uh, so I was I was running Waste One Two Three part time. I was investing. I was uh, building Language One Two Three. I became the, c the founder of Casting One Two Three. I wasn't executing Casting One Two Three myself. I built a team to to run uh, Casting One Two Three. And based on my experience, it's much better when you focus in just uh, one at a time. That, but now, when you focus in one at a time, you have to iterate really fast because you're going to make a lot of mistakes. You have to switch the business model. You have to find what works, what doesn't work. So instead of trying multiple ideas uh, in parallel, it's better to try one idea at a time, but really fast. So try the experiment that doesn't work next, 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 until you find the one that is going to, to work. Thank you, Alex.